So I'll get started here. I uh, wanted to play a minute here with the uh, software. I, so what I did is um, I calculated a few um, component functions for um, some examples. And let's see here. So you, you, I think you guys realize that, you know, it, it, the problem of finding the component functions of a given, um, you know, complex, complex function is an important skill that you need to, to have here, right? Because like a lot of what we do is based on finding those u and v, right? So if f is a complex function, we say u and v are the component functions, right? So here, for example, um, you can calculate f of z equal to, oh, for example, 1 over z, right? And um, if you write that out, that gives you x minus iy over x squared plus y squared by the usual trick. And so from this, I can see u is x over x squared plus y squared, right? And v is minus y over x squared plus y squared, yeah? For example, all right? And, um, machine. and then we can, um, we can use, you know, some kind of graphing utility to try to understand what that looks like in terms of level curves. Um, so I like Desmos for this. It's easy to use. And, you know, so here, let's look at some level curves of u. So u is equal to x divided by parentheses x squared plus y squared. Should have brought my glasses. I have some iPad over there. And then I want to set that equal to, you know, a constant. So I add a slider here. And so you can see maybe what the level curves of U look like, right? Let's see here if I, I'll animate them. Should be a little animated for my animation button. Oh, there it is. So as u gets really large in magnitude, <clears throat> it gets really tiny, doesn't it? See that? I mean, you can hardly see it at all. So it's just like a little, kind of looks like a little dot, right? And then you see it's doing what? It's becoming a circle, right? And it flips. What happens right in between the circles to the right and the circles to the left for this? Spans the plane. Yeah, I think. Well, that's a good question. Does every is every point on the plane hit by this thing? Hey, stop! Oh, I'm chasing it. I can't get to it. Let's see here. Let me change the parameter values here to go from say uh, just minus. Uh, I'll go from minus two to two instead of ten to ten. Minus ten to ten. Minus two to two in step size. I'll use like zero point zero one there. There we go. I slowed it down a little bit, didn't I? So you can kind of get a sense of what the different level curves of the U function are, right? They're all circles, looks like, right? It's just they either flip right or left. And yeah, maybe. Let's see. Yeah. Let's see here. I, yeah, maybe every point. I'm not sure. Um, I hadn't thought about that. What happens when we plug in zero? And you can think about this, right, so u equals to zero here gives us just the y. So that's an exceptional case, right? Between, we got a family of circles, this vertical line, and other family of circles, right? All right, so that's, those are the, those are the, um, so one of your homework problems, like problem 29, I think, I've asked you to visualize the level curves of the component functions, right? I would urge you to use this program to do it. Um, we can do more, right? We can also look at v, which is minus y divided by parentheses 
x squared plus y squared, yeah? So we can look at that at the same time. Set that equal to something else. Let's say b as slider. And I'll make b go from minus 2 to 2 again so I can see better what's going on, right? And my step size, I'll make like 0 0.01, so I got a, a good amount of them. Look at this. So lo and behold, now we've got circles doing what? Yeah, they're flipping either down or up vertically, right? These are the level curves of B. And what do you notice about the intersection? Do you see how they intersect? The, like, notice that the, the place where these two curves, the green and the um, <clears throat> red curves intersect, we have an orthogonal meeting, right? Yeah. That's to be expected from what we did last time, right? So here. So now you can, I know it's kind of dizzying, right? But if you look, wherever these two guys are meeting, they're meeting at a right angle. See that? No matter where the meeting place happens. see here. Well, I can just stop. I can just kind of move them around one at a time, yeah? But I'll just, when I play them both, it's hard to see what's going on, right? But as you can see, where they meet, they meet at a right angle, right? That's not an accident because we're looking at the level curves of the component functions, right? Which we proved last time are going to meet perpendicularly, except wh where is that not guaranteed? Where the derivative is 0, right? So how about this function? Where does this function have derivative 0? Well, it has derivative 0. Where's the derivative not defined, rather? Well, just at the origin, right? Um, so another example that I worked out that might be interesting, possibly, is Um, f of z equal e to the z squared, right? So that's e to the x squared minus y squared um, plus 2ixy. So we work that out, and that gives us e to the x squared minus y squared cosine 2xy plus e to the x i e to the x squared minus y squared sine 2xy. So here's my u, and here's my v. And I think if we look at the level curves of those functions, that they're going to be a little bit more exotic than what we just had here, right? Let's, let's see here what happens. We look at we have e to the what? e to the parentheses, e to the um, x squared minus y squared. Oops, stupid parentheses. And then times what? Cosine of 2xy equal to a constant. Whoa, look at that. Let me try to be lazy here. Cut and paste. Don't need a minus there, yeah? That's supposed to, of course, they're the same. I haven't changed the formula yet, right? The other one's got a sine instead of a cosine. Let's see here. What's going on here? When I get to... So here's zero for the one. And... These are, this is kind of hard to look at, isn't it? Let's see if I can zoom in a bit. So I know these, these curves are, I mean, if you ask me to graph, right, e to the x squared minus y squared times cosine 2xy equal to a constant, I would have no earthly idea what it looks like, right? But Desmos does it without thinking, right? It was just numerically, basically. And, and you can see, again, wherever the level curves of the component functions meet, 
they meet perpendicularly, right? They're orthogonal trajectories. It's pretty neat. Um, I guess the, the more complicated question here is where, where are we not going to have orthogonal trajectories guaranteed? I like funny stuff goes on, right? When, when is the derivative zero? No, no, the derivative of e to the z squared, though. Right, 2z e to the z squared, right, by the chain rule. So, so, yeah, so something funny happens at the origin is the bottom line. And if you play with this a bit, you'll see that there's more than one curve that goes to the origin, and they don't all meet, um, you know. Well, it's hard for me to find the one. It, it, it's fussy. I, I saw it a second ago here, but it was really, where'd that thing go? Well, the, look at that. There's two um, V curves through the origin, and they both meet perpendicularly, you know? And I can't even, I can't even get the stupid, well, anyway. Um, let me stop with this one here. Um, Another one. Well, anyway, my point is you can plug in level curves. And I have a, I've calculated a few more here. Let's, let's look at one other, and then we'll stop with this. Um, here's the level. So I calculated z to the fourth. The real component of z to the fourth is um, x to the fourth minus 6x squared y squared. Um, plus y to the fourth. That's the real component of z to the fourth. Oh man, did it put it all in the exponent? Yar. You gotta watch it. Otherwise, it'll keep putting stuff in the exponent where you don't want it to be in the exponent. You know. Come on. Four, let's see, z to the fourth. The other component, the real imaginary component of z to the fourth is 4x cubed y minus 4xy cubed. I'll, I'll try to um, scan this page for you and like post it in course content so you have the formulas I'm working off of, guys. Um, but anyway, here's the, let me zoom out a bit. So the, the real component, you get this like family of sort of, I don't want to say hyperbolas, they're not exactly that, but like a double hyperbola or something, you know? Um, and, hmm, man, that does not look like, that right there does not look like an orthogonal trajectory, does it? That makes me think I made a mistake in my algebra or in my entry my entering of the uh, formula. Oh, it's because I put a y. Look at this. See, see, see this y? That was supposed to be multiplication by y, not x to the 3y. There we go. Now we got it. So wherever these, wherever these characters meet, if we could see it, I'll zoom in a bit. At the points of intersection, you see you have, again, you know, orthogonal trajectories, the u and the z level curves. So I would encourage you to use Desmos to do that problem. Okay, that's all I'm saying. All right, let me put this away now that we're done with this. So I looked up, um, so on my drive here today, I was trying to think in my head how to see that, um, you know, circles, map the circles under the inversion map, right? I tried to do that last time, and I got stuck on it. And, um, you know, I, I thought about it my whole drive here, and I still couldn't figure it out. And, um, and then I looked it up in this book, 
um, Stephen Fisher's complex variables, and it is um, actually not that easy. Um, it's kind of a sneaky argument he has in here to do it. Um, so I'm just going to not I'm gonna spend class time on that at the moment. I'll just say that it's not entirely obvious why that's true, but it is in fact true. And um, so what it, what is the truth I'm allu alluding to? It's that if we have a fractional linear transformation, right, then um, we map what? Circles to circles. Um, however, um, to be clear, when I say we map circles to circles, it's with the understanding that a line is also thought of as a circle. Um, so we're really saying generalized circles map to generalized circles. Um, so let's get into it. Yeah. My eraser shirt out here. Come on. I mean, seeing that a translation, right, maps a circle to a circle, um, that's, that's easy enough. And a dilation, that was easy enough. But the fact that the inversion maps circles to circles, that's not entirely trivial. So perhaps I'll come back to it in class time in a future day. I'm just, I just found it right before class. I don't want to muddle through it here at the moment. And I still hold out hope I can find an argument simpler than the one I just found in Fisher's book. Um, anyway, so. FLT, fractional linear transformation, something of the form f of z equal to az plus b over cz plus d, where um, we actually need the condition that, let's see here, how's it go? Come on. AD minus BC minus BC is not equal to zero. So this condition we need in order that it not be degenerate, all right? And um, so this is also called a Mobius transformation. Um, and we, we proved last time that any one of those can be written as the composite of a translation, a dilation, and an inversion, all right? And in fact, likewise, if you take two of these and you can compose them, like if you take two FLTs and you compose them together, guess what? You get another FLT. So they're kind of neat functions in that, like, when you compose them, you get back another function of the same type. That's pretty neat. And um, the other, um, so let me just read a paragraph here from, from Fisher because I think it's helpful. Um, Nope, nope, that was not the one. Well, rats. See, if I could remember what I was reading before class, that'd be awesome. But um, let's look at um, what happens. We'll look at inversion, right? And let's try to see, let's try to map mapping of circle, and let's map this circle, the circle through um, the origin, all right? Let's, let's see what happens with that circle when we try to feed it to the um, reciprocal map, right? So um, let's see here, we could do what? We could just parameterize the circle, if you like, What's the, what's the formula? Z equal to what? So I guess it depends on how big the circle is. Let's suppose that the circle has radius 1 and it's centered at 1. So Z is equal to like 1 plus cosine T, right, plus I sine T, 0 less than or equal to T, less than or equal to 2 pi, if you don't mind me going around. So that, that gives you a um, counterclockwise oriented circle, right? Standard. That's the standard uh, parametric formulas from like calculus three. We do cosine t for this for the for the uh, x part, sine t for the y part, and the radius is one. All right. So anyway, you can you can easily verify that this um, satisfies 
uh, what does it satisfy? It satisfies modulus of z minus 1 equals to 1, which we could recognize immediately as the collection of all points, right, which has distance 1 from the center 1, okay? So that is an honest goodness parameterization of that circle. Let's feed it to the reciprocal map. Where does it go? Right, so what's f of, you know, 1 plus cosine t plus i sine t? What happens? We get 1 over 1 plus cosine t plus i sine t, right? And I know that that's a little bit intimidating. Like, what is that? Right? What is that? Well, I think the first thing I would do is I would put it into Cartesian form so I could better understand it, right? So that's easy enough to do. We do 1 plus cosine t minus i sine t. And when we multiply the bottom by its conjugate, we get the length of the bottom complex number squared, the denominator squared, which of course is 1 plus cosine t squared, right? Um, plus sine squared t. So if we want to, you can think of that. Um, uh, yeah, I think we can simplify that more because, um, let's see here. So if I say that this is equal to, you know, x plus iy, then what are the formulas for x and y? x is what? 1 plus cosine t over... And that gives me, um, let me, let me simplify this denominator over here before I do anything else. 1 plus cosine t squared is what? 1 plus 2 cosine t, right? Plus cosine squared t? Right. <clears throat> so yeah, when we add sine squared to this, we get sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. We get this is 1, so we get a 2 plus 2 cosine t. Which, notice, check that out, we've got 1 plus cosine t over 2 times 1 plus cosine t, yeah? Hey, that's kind of neat. What happens? We just get a, get a half, yeah. One half. And how about y? Well, same kind of similar song and dance, but this time we get minus sine t over, um, well, 2 times 1 plus cosine t, right? The same denominator. So what, what is this? And by the way, um, if t goes from 0 to 2 pi, are we in trouble? We are in trouble, right? When this, this, this right here is for t not equal to pi, right? That's not terribly surprising, right? Because um, 1 over 0 is well, what is that, right? Yeah. Or if we work in the extended complex plane, 1 over 0 is infinity. Um, now, the second one here, I think what we, maybe, maybe we can, maybe we can make progress by multiplying by 1 minus cosine t over 1 minus cosine t, you see what happens, yeah? See, because then you get... Um, yeah, we get minus... Yeah, I get uh, minus, yeah, minus sine t, plus sine t, cosine t, 
divided by, what do you say, 2 times what? Cosine squared. Yeah, well, minus. 1 minus cosine squared, yeah. Which, of course, is sine squared t, right? So since that's sine squared t, we really just get 1 half of, um, well, nothing pretty. I guess we could say 1 half of cosine t minus 1 over sine t. I don't know. That doesn't really tell me much. And so, in fact, I'm, I'm kind of at a loss here in terms of direct parametric reasoning, right? So if I'm doing a problem like this, right, and I'm kind of... Yeah, you get tangent minus cosecant. But um, tangent... Well, yeah, I mean, we could write it cotangent minus uh, cosecant, sure, but then... Well, I guess that's not bad. You're not wrong. You're not wrong. Yeah, let me, let me. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, what I was trying to say here is if you actually get stuck, then that's a great time to go and use Desmos to see what the thing looks like, right? If, if algebra fails you, try technology on this kind of thing. Um, so what, what happens to cotangent? What are the values that cotangent take? Do the cotangent take? I mean, maybe I can do, let's see here, cosine of t, oh, yowzers. Um, in any event, <clears throat> as to not waste the entire class on this, what happens, right, is, so let me draw the image curve. The image curve is what? X is equal to 1 half, right? That's easy enough. What can Y be? I think if you start sorting through the different values that this expression takes, as t ranges from 0 to pi, you're going to see that you go from minus infinity to infinity. All right? So what that means then is it's, don't ask me exactly how, because I don't quite see it at the moment, but this is what that circle maps to. It maps to this vertical line. Because x is a half, and then the y, you know, um, ranges over the values of cosine cotangent t minus cosecant t in a somewhat annoying, complicated way, right? So, ah, because here I'm proposing that we should understand, we should view FLT as mapping on the complex numbers unioned with infinity the so-called extended complex plane. Okay. And so the rules are, for the extended complex plane, basically just this. 1 over infinity is 0 for us. That's the, that's the main one. Yes. Now, um, you say, well, well, that's just nonsense. Like, what do you mean? Well, this is where um, chapter 1 gives you this construction of the so-called um, stereographic projection, right? The, the, here I'll tell you, on page, come on, where'd you go? I found it a second ago here. So like on page 11 and 12 in, um, you know, in, uh, in Gamelin here, basically he, he shows you that there's this mapping. You can basically put the North Pole up here and you can, um, um, <clears throat> draw a line that connects like this. Let's see here. And um, so this point, the point of intersection of the sphere and the, between the, the line that connects to the North Pole and the sphere calls that XYZ, capital XYZ. And that maps to a point on the complex plane you call z equal to little x plus i y. Um, so to, I mean, the, the complex plane is 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 set so that it's basically. Oh man, I, don't know, I should have done this on the whiteboard. This is miserable. Um, 
So I, I, I'm not trying to do it justice here, but so the, it's it's the um, it intersects with the uh, equator to the sphere. So this is actually sitting under the complex plane, if you will. Um, here's a here's a here's a bird's eye, uh, straight on view of it. The, the sphere is like is is like this. The North Pole's up here. This is the we can view this as the complex plane looked at as a subset of R3, right? Complex plane identified with is that equal basically to R2 Cartesian product with zero as a subset of R3. That's the the, the idea here. And um, with respect to that, um, and that mapping I'm just describing there is the stereographic projection. And um, so he gives, he gives you straight up formulas. Um, let's see here. So, for example, if this line from the North Pole intersects the equatorial line, like that, so that's like a point on the complex plane. In that case, um, big X and big Y are just little x and y, because z equal to zero on the equator. And the formulas, in general, are as follows. Um, x is equal to um, big X over 1 minus big Z. And y is equal to big Y over 1 minus big Z. So you see what happens when big Z is equal to 0. You just get little x equal to big X, right? And then he also has the inverse formulas for that. Big X is, you know, 2x over modulus of z squared plus 1. Big Y is equal to 2y over modulus of z squared plus 1. And big Z is a little bit compl complicated, but it's um, modulus of z squared minus 1 over modulus of z squared plus 1. So these formulas I'm writing show you how to get. So th these, these formulas are the stereographic projection. And um, you can think of the Poincare sphere, as it's sometimes called, as a model for the extended complex plane, where the North Pole plays the role of infinity. Um, like, let's see here if we can sort through these formulas right quick. Notice that. Um, the intersection is the unit circle. What's the unit circle in the complex plane? The unit circle in the complex plane is where modulus of z is 1. See this formula? Big Z equals to 0 when modulus of z is 1. So that shows to, goes to show you that if you look at the image of the unit circle on the Poincare sphere, you get the equatorial circle, right? Um, on the flip side of things, if you try to put z equal to 1, what happens? See what happens with big Z equal to 1? See these formulas here? They don't like that, do they? Right, so these formulas are technically undefined for big Z equal to 1. Or you could think of them as blowing up to infinity. That makes, in that sense, you can think of the North Pole as infinity for the model. Um, and there's, it's more than this. Th like, these mappings are conformal in the sense that if you look at uh, curves on the Poincare sphere, and the angle between curves, the curves that they map to on the complex plane under the stereographic projection enjoy the same angle of intersection. And you can also see like circles map to circles, lines map to lines. And um, anyway, so just, just a, a short tour of this thing. We don't really work much with it. I'm just saying that if you want to understand what is the extended complex plane, you can think about the Poincare sphere. It's a way of a concrete model of it. All right. Circles map to circles in the generalized sense. In the generalized sense. Like generalized circle. So a generalized circle is a circle or a line through infinity. All lines go through infinity in the extended complex. Like any, any line in the complex plane becomes a circle through infinity. So like, all right. So you're saying like the, it, it wraps around the sphere? Yeah, what I'm saying is if I studied 
a line in the complex plane like this, yeah. it would end up giving you something up here that I, I don't know exactly, like this is totally like yeah, yeah. sketch, but it would give you some kind of circle. Well, or yeah, something. I mean, I, I don't know if it goes through. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not committing to that. <laughs> um, but I do know that that circle would go through the North Pole. Okay. Because that, this line goes to infinity, and that in, point at infinity gets mapped to the North Pole. Gotcha. And so that's, and so like that line on the complex plane would actually get mapped to a genuine circle on the Poincare sphere, if I understand things correctly. So anyway, I'm saying more than we need. So let me stop doing that because I don't really have the uh, <clears throat> I don't have the, the time or the willpower to prove all the claims I'm making at the moment, um, and we don't really need them. All right, so none of this exactly helps you with the homework I've assigned you on the um, FLT. And there is something I really should share with you. Um, all right, so theorem given any triple of points Z0, Z1, Z2 in the extended complex plane, which we call C star, by the way. So this is C star. Um, any um, triple distinct, I forgot the word distinct, that's important. Distinct triple points and distinct triple W naught, W1, W2, again in the extended complex plane. All right. There exists unique FLT on the extended complex plane for which F of Z, J equals W, J for J equals to zero. 1 and 2. And again, our rule for working with infinity is 1 over infinity is 0, infinity times a constant is 0. And to be more honest, expressions of the form infinity over infinity have to actually be carefully analyzed by a limiting procedure, All right, just as we did in calculus 1. Uh, let's, let's look at a, so I'm not going to prove this theorem, yeah, but I'm going to illustrate it. All right. And so example, this is my example 2.7.4. So I want to take one, two, three. I want to find a Mobius transformation, a fractional linear transformation that is, that maps one, two, three to zero, i, and infinity respective. So the way to do this, is, let's see here, so to get the infinity, so one over, one over z minus three, right, maps three to one over zero, which is infinity, all right? So if I use one over z minus three, that, that's helpful, right? And how, how can I get, yeah, how can I get to go to zero? So, and, and, oh, and if I just put, instead, instead of putting one upstairs, I put z minus one, right? z minus one over z minus three. And that also maps one to zero. What? Wait, I don't. I mean, I'm saying f of z equals to this. This is my formula for f of z. I'm not sure what you mean. So notice that this still leaves me a freedom in the construction of this FLT, right? Because you can still take this FLT, this Mobius transformation, if you'd rather call it that, 
and we can multiply it by a complex constant, yeah? So we can multiply this by some constant, let's call it A. And what should we make A equal to? Well, that, you notice there's one thing we haven't used yet, which is that 2 is supposed to map to I, right? So we want F of 2, which by the way is what? A times what? 2 minus 1 over 2 minus 3, also known as what? 1 over minus 1. So that's minus A, right? So we want minus A equal to I. So therefore, select A equal to minus I. And there you have it, F of Z equals to minus I times Z minus 1 over Z minus 3 is the mapping, which maps 1, 2, 3 to 0, I, infinity. I can draw a picture of what's going on. Here's my Z plane. I've got 1, I've got 2, I've got 3. And where are they mapping to over here in the W plane? They're mapping respectively to 0, I, and yeah, we can think of that as being infinity. And so if you think about this as an oriented curve, right? Think about this as an oriented curve. Well, it's the boundary of what? One, two, three. So think about going this way. On your left, it's all the way up here, this stuff up here, right? That's to the left of that, that curve. Up here, so this is going zero to one. To, so this, this is oriented that way in that view. So what's on the left here? This here, right? So this FLT will map the upper half plane to the left half plane, like that. I mean, you can try it out explicitly. F of, you know, 1 plus i, what happens? So those cancel, right? And we get 1 over minus 2 plus i, yeah? Which is minus 2 minus i over 5. Yeah, that's over here somewhere. Yeah. Not an accident. Now, I wish they were all this easy to find, all right? Like, that was not bad, was it? Maybe your homework problem isn't really much worse than that anyway. I can't remember. Um, so, <laughs> you know, when you're, when you're given a triple of points which are less easy, there is a trick that you can use. All right. And the trick is given by something called the cross ratio. So it turns out if you solve the cross ratio, given a distinct pair of triples and the map and the map the triple that you're mapping to, if you solve the cross ratio, you can find the FLT from solving the cross ratio. That is obviously not the um, approach I took in example 2.74, right? Um, so here's the cross ratio. So what you do is you take W1 minus W, W3 minus W2, W1 minus W2, right? W3 minus W equal to Z1 minus Z times Z3 minus Z2 over Z, Z1 minus Z2. See the pattern's the same, right? Um, Z3 minus Z. You take this and you solve for W equals to F of Z.
that will give you the FLT that maps Z1, Z2, Z3 to W1, W2, W3. All right. Here, so for example, if we had something like we're going to map um, I'll do a hard one, one with infinity. We want to, suppose we want to map I infinity 3 to infinity 0, 1, right? We're trying to find the FLT that does that. So let's see here. W1 is what? So here's W1, W2, W3. Here's Z1, Z2, Z3. So I just plug them in. See what happens. I get um, W1 is infinity minus W over W1, excuse me, uh, W1 minus W2, infinity minus zero, right? And then W3 minus W2, one minus zero, and then W3 minus W, which is one minus W. On the flip side, we've got i minus z over z1 minus z2, i minus infinity. And z3 minus z2, 3 minus infinity. And z3 minus z, that's 3 minus z. Right? And I say this simplifies to 1 over 1 minus w. And so you, you can use the kind of logic that you, <laughs> you, you think you ought to be able to use, right? Like, if you've got something that's infinity over infinity, right, does the w matter? It don't matter, right? Over here, 3 minus infinity, i minus infinity, does the 3 or the i matter? They don't matter. So we can just cancel. This and that, and we can cancel that and that. Notice there's a minus on both, right? So this gives us what? This gives us 1 over 1 minus w equals to i minus z over 3 minus z. We'd like to solve for w, right? So flip it. 1 minus w equals to 3 minus z over i minus z. And lo and behold, we got ourselves a w equals to 3 minus z over i minus z, right, um, plus 1. And of course, you could make a common denominator and make that into a manifestly FLT. What did I do? Did I do wrong? Oh, I need, I'm missing a minus here, yeah. So z minus 3, let's say. So move that to the other side and this to the other side. Like flip. Yeah. And now you can check it, right? Check the formula. All right, so we can check our work, yeah? Does i go to infinity? Good. Yeah, we got division by zero there. That's where infinity's happening. Uh, how about infinity? Does infinity go to zero? You plug in infinity here, yeah. and there you get infinity over minus infinity, which is minus one. Yeah. Minus one plus one, zero. So yeah, infinity maps to zero. Does three map to one? Well. Oh, yeah, yep, three maps to one. So this cross ratio is a very nice trick to know about when the techniques of my previous example don't quite gel for you. Um, and here it would be, you know, here, what, what, what's, what's a curve that has i infinity and three? What's going on here? I infinity and 3. 
Infinity is supposed to be in the middle, too. <laughs> I, don't, I don't, well, I have a hard time visualizing that. Um, like yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't, well, I think the bottom line is if I try to put those on a line, I can't do that, right? I mean, like, if I, see if I, um, if you like, I could flip, I could, I could, I could go I and, see, I could do this. I could do I, three, and then way over here, infinity, right? Like that. And if I did that, instead of, like, I'm just flipping the three and the infinity, and then I would be mapping to infinity, one, and zero. Um, uh, well, let's look at it this way. So I'm, I'm mapping in the W plane like that, um, like this, right? So to the left, I'd be mapping here, this upper plane to this lower half plane. But I, you know, to make sense of it, I have to put the, the triple so that they're along either a line or a circle that makes sense. Anyway, so you can either understand it in terms of lines or circles, but I think I'm out of time for today, so I better, better, better be quiet. Next slide.